Hi, and welcome to AP Chemistry Review. It's me, Dr. V, and I'm here to help you get ready for the AP Chemistry exam in May. So today, in this webcast, we're going through the first free response question from the 2019 exam. This is one of the long free response questions, and it was scored out of 10 points. I always recommend that students try to work through the problem on their own before they listen to my solution. So before you get to work, make sure you have your calculator handy, you need your periodic table, you need your formula sheet to get going on this. Now you can work through all the parts of the question and then listen to me, or you can do one section at a time and listen to my explanation. It's all good, no matter how you do it, but if you really want this to be effective, you need to try it on your own first, okay? And then you can keep track of your score as you go. And pay attention to how you need to enhance what you wrote down so that you get all the points. All right, this is really how it's going to be most effective for you. So let's jump right into the problem. The compound urea, we're given the formula, is widely used in chemical fertilizers, and we're also given a Lewis structure. All right, great. Part A asks, what's the hybridization of the carbon atom in the urea molecule that we're shown here? Now, this question was scored out of one point, all right, and there's only one carbon atom, so there's no ambiguity about what we're looking at here. We need the hybridization. All right, so the answer is uh, sp2. I've highlighted the carbon atom so we can look at it. How did I know it was sp2, All right? So I look at the carbon atom that I highlighted in blue, and I see that there are three atoms bonded to it. And there's no lone pairs around the carbon atom, All right? So there are three electron domains around that carbon. The fact that the oxygen is double bonded to the carbon, there's still only one electron domain there. It's not how many bonds, it's how many atoms are bonded to it. All right, so there are three bonded atoms and no lone pairs attached to that carbon atom. Three electron domains, so it's sp2 hybridized. All you had to write down was sp2. Don't feel like you need to write out an explanation if the question didn't ask for that. All right, let's go on to part B. Urea is very soluble in water because it can form hydrogen bonds between water and urea. All right, and so we've got a depiction of a urea molecule. All right, we've got all this color coding going on, and it's surrounded by four water molecules in this box. And the question asks us to draw one dashed line to indicate a possible location of a hydrogen bond between a water molecule and urea. This question was scored out of one point, all right, so it's pretty much all or nothing. And what really helps here is to know that definition of a hydrogen bond. You need to have a hydrogen atom that's bonded to a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine atom in one molecule, and then have it be attracted to a different molecule's nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine atom. There's actually more than one location in this box where we could actually draw our dashed line. And just as a reminder, follow instructions. You were asked for a dashed line, your answer should really be a dashed line and not a solid line. So just pay attention to those little details. All right, so my first possibility uh, that I drew, I've got my little dashed line here, all right, has the oxygen in the top left water molecule attracted to a hydrogen atom in the urea molecule and this hydrogen atom is attracted to a nitrogen so it meets our definition right you want to make sure that it that we're demonstrating that understanding right it's not about writing out definitions it's about applying it here's another location right also a water molecule the oxygen of the water molecule attracted to the h in urea that's bonded to a nitrogen atom all right there's at least one more location where i could draw a similar hydrogen bond here okay so um, let's go on to part C. We've got an equation here that shows urea going into solution um, where water is the solvent. A student finds that 5.39 grams of urea, and we're given its molar mass, can dissolve in water to make 5.00 milliliters of a saturated solution at 20 degrees Celsius. It's a saturated solution. This is as much urea as we can dissolve at this temperature uh, in that volume of water. Okay, well, it's actually the total volume of solution that matters, not the volume of the water. And part C asks us to find the molarity of this saturated solution at this temperature. So uh, this question was scored out of two points. And the place to start is really the molarity formula, moles of solute over the volume of the solution in liters. I like to substitute in the grams per mole definition into my equation. Uh, it just makes my life easier. And that's how I like to do it. Um, so I know the mass of the solute. I know the molar mass that was given to me. I know the volume of the solution in milliliters. 
uh, we need to make sure that we put it into liters when we do our math. So I can substitute everything in. Again, we were given the molar mass of urea, so we didn't even have to find that. And I can put that all in. And like I said, I do have to make sure that I convert my volume to liters or my answer will be off by three orders of magnitude, which is always kind of awkward. Um, so then I can actually pull out my calculator. I can answer 17.9 molar for the um, urea concentration. So effectively, there was one point given for finding the moles of urea and then one point for correctly finding the molarity of the solution. Um, if you So if you chose to write it, write it out into two parts, that's fine. I like to put it all together. What matters is that you show enough work to support your answer and that your answer comes out to be correct. Okay, let's go on. The student also finds that the concentration of urea in a saturated solution at 25 degrees Celsius, okay, so we've raised the temperature, is 19.8 molar as opposed to 17.9 molar, which we had in part C. Based on this information, is this process endothermic or exothermic? Justify your answer in terms of Le Chatelier's principle. This was scored out of one point, so your answer really was all or nothing. Um, so what we found comparing the information given here to what we did on in part C is that when the temperature is increased, the concentration of the urea in solution goes up. All right. So in other words, this stress on the system caused the system to shift right. Okay. So that implies that the energy term belongs with the reactants, which means that the process must be endothermic. So for this problem, this part, you needed to say that it was endothermic and really go into your reasoning, all right, in terms of Le Chatelier's principle. Uh, you needed to have both parts to earn the point, all right? Okay, let's go on to part E, all right? The equipment shown above is provided for the student to find the enthalpy of solution for urea, all right? We're given the specific heat of the solution. Okay, list the, the specific measurements that are required to be made during the experiment. And you know, if you've done an experiment where you found enthalpy of solution experimentally, you are really having an advantage with this particular question. So the other thing that you need to keep in mind for this question, which was scored out of two points, is that it's asking for measurements, not calculations. What measurements do you need to carry out? There are two of them. Well, actually, there's four of them. I misspoke. All right. So we need to find the change in temperature, but the change in temperature is a calculation. The measurements are that you need to know the initial temperature of the water and the final temperature of the water before the urea went in and then after the urea went in. All right. Um, and that was worth one point for saying the initial and final temperature um, measurements for the water. You also needed to know the mass of urea used in your experiment and the mass of the water used in the experiment. Based on the, the materials here, that's what you would measure. So you had to have all four of these to get the two points. Part F, the entropy change for the dissolution of urea is 70.1 joules per mole per Kelvin at 25 degrees Celsius. And then we have a table here that gives us the enthalpy of formation, I'm sorry, the entropy of formation for solid urea. And the question asks us to find the um, molar entropy of aqueous urea. So this was scored out of one point and it's really some math, right? Entropy is a state function, so we can look at the entropy of the products minus the entropy of the reactants, all right? Um, and so the pro it does help to remember the equation here. So let's bring that back because it wasn't on view, all right? The solid was the reactant and uh, dissolved urea was the product. So we want to know the entropy of the product. We know the overall change. We know the reactant, all right? And so we have to do a little algebra. We were given delta S of reaction. We know um, delta S for, or the entropy for the product, or the reactant, we're trying to find the product. We need to solve for X here. Substitute and evaluate, all right? And so we plug that in, and we get an answer of 174.7 joules per mole per Kelvin, all right? So I'm just doing some very simple algebra and solving for the piece that I don't know, all right? Um, and because it's a state function, I can do this. Great. Uh, let's go on to the next part of the question, all right? Using particle level reasoning, explain why the change in entropy for this process is positive. All right, 
this was scored out of one point as well. The question is really asking, why does the entropy increase when urea dissolves in water? All right. Well, in solid urea, the molecules are in a very structured ordered arrangement, right? They're in a solid. They're all very close together. They're very close packed, right? That's a very low entropy situation, all right? So as on a part of the level model, you might think of it being something like this, right? But when it's dissolved, there are more possible arrangements for the urea molecules because they're dissolved in water. They're free to move around, right? There's more ways to arrange them. So I'm just showing the urea molecules here and not the water molecules, but there's a lot more possibilities for those particles in terms of their arrangements, right? And that's really what they wanted you to talk about. And in fact, what they really wanted when they scored this question was this idea about more microstates, more arrangements, more possibilities. It's a more sophisticated way of talking about it instead of just saying, oh, entropy went up, there's more randomness. All right, this is a little deeper in terms of your explanation. All right. And then finally, the student claims that delta S for the process contributes to the thermodynamic favorability of the dissolution of urea at this temperature. Use the information from the problem that we've gotten to support the claim. Okay, this was also scored out of one point. So thermodynamically favorable, otherwise known as being spontaneous, means that delta G is a negative value. All right, and the definition of delta G is that delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. All right, and we know from part D and our work there that the process is endothermic, which means delta H is a positive value. All right, so if we need delta G to be negative, it would really be helpful for delta S to be positive. And we know that that is true from the work we just did in part F. All right, and so the T delta S term is really the key here. Delta H is positive, all right? The temperature, we're at 298 Kelvin. We always want to be in Kelvin temperatures when we do these problems. And the entropy change is positive. So the T delta S term makes the value of delta G lower, makes it smaller, hopefully negative, all right, compared to delta H. We don't actually have any numbers here, but if delta G is getting smaller, that's making it more favorable. And that's really what kind of reasoning you needed to use here. Okay, so go back. How did you do out of the 10 points? How many points did you earn? In 2019, the average score was 5.54 points out of 10, which is actually fairly high for a long free response question in AP Chemistry. Um, so if you earned six points or more, you did quite well on this question. If not, you might want to go back and review some of the skills and concepts and just think about how you can enhance your answers so that when you see similar questions in the future on similar topics, you're better prepared to answer them thoroughly. And if you haven't already done so, please respond. I want you to subscribe to my channel, Dr. V, and I want you to do well in that AP Chemistry exam.